Today is May 16th, uh, 2018. My name is Hanson Sue, curator uh, at the Computer History Museum. I'm conducting an oral history interview of Brian McCoon. This is part of the ongoing oral history program of the Software Industry Special Interest Group, which is part of the Computer History Museum in Mountain View, California. We are here at the Computer History Museum. This interview is being recorded uh, and videotaped and will be transcribed, edited, and posted on the Computer History Museum website. Let's get started. Okay. So, first things first, uh, where and when were you born and where did you grow up? Okay. I was born in Portland, Oregon, and I grew up there for, until I went to college, for 18 years. Um, so what, what, what was your um, parent, what did your parents do? What was your background? Uh, well, my mother was a homemaker and uh, my father started out as a lumberjack because in the early days of the 20th century there was still a lot of timber in Oregon. And then he um, moved from that to being a uh, roofing and siding and home remodeling contractor. In fact, he ended up being the second largest roofing and siding contractor in Oregon in the 40s, 50s, 60s. So pretty low tech. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, what were your interests as a child? I had a great childhood um, and uh, I had an early uh, helicopter soccer mom for a mom. So she got me into everything you can imagine from uh, uh, swimming to Cub Scouts and the Boy Scouts and uh, programs at my uh, church. Um, probably my, my biggest interest has always been music. And so I was in the boys choir at my church from age eight. And then later I was the only kid in high school allowed to, you know, allowed to be in the main choir. Uh, and then I was in choirs in high school, and oddly enough, <laughs> I played Lancelot in Camelot in 1967. That's probably one of the peaks of my career, or that side of my career. <laughs> was your family particularly religious? Um, well, yes and no. I mean, we uh, went to uh, church Every week, my father was a um, trustee of our church. And um, so, yeah, I'd say we were fairly religious, but nothing special, especially for the 50s. I mean, pretty much in the United States, everyone went to some church, I, th I would say. Any particular denomination? Yeah, we were members of Westminster Presbyterian Church okay. in uh, Northeast Portland. Um, what were your favorite subjects in school? Uh, pretty much everything except art, handwriting, and PE. <laughs> so I'm, I'm sort of, um, my brain is ambidextrous. I'm very good at math and science, but I'm also very good at um, languages and writing and comprehension. Um, and then, as I mentioned, music. So I really loved everything. I was probably best at math and science, but I wouldn't say that, um, that I liked them to the exclusion of everything else. That came later. <laughs> <laughs> that um, came in college, really. Yeah. <laughs> um, Did you have any influential teachers? Well, um, as far as how I got into um, the computing industry and into um, AI and expert systems uh, research and then development, it all started in my um, sophomore English class with Mrs. Allen, A-L-L-E-N. We can do spellings later, I assume. No, it's fine. Yeah. And uh, unfortunately, I can't remember her first name, but that year, in high school, you had to um, do an essay on what do I want to be when I grew up, because they're trying to 
get you to realize that as a 15 year old or 16 year old, uh, this is going to end pretty soon. The gravy train ends soon. You're either going to go to college or trade school or get a job, whatever. So I don't know. I honestly don't know where, but I said I want to be a computer programmer. This was in 1965. Now, I will tell you, there were fewer than 12 computers in the entire state of Oregon at that time. And I, so I don't know, I must have been reading about computers in Scientific American and uh, Popular Science Magazine and these sorts of things. And I found out that there was a girl in my class and her father ran the computer center for the largest bank in Oregon. So I got him to give me a tour. So I found, I found the computer. That was step one. <laughs> How did you, so, so you mentioned like the, you had been reading popular science type articles, like how, how did you, was that how you f discovered computers? What, what were you I don't science really, fiction? Or? Somehow I knew that they existed, but I didn't really know much beyond that. But I, I'm a very logical person. That's how, why I got into artificial intelligence. Um, I like to organize data. I like to figure out how you can search data uh, of all sorts, signals images, text, relational data, any sort of data. Um, and that's always been true. I used to read the encyclopedia for fun when I was in like the second or third grade. Uh, you know, it's just strange. But So somehow I knew there were computers and I knew that if I could find some and learn about them, I would be interested in that. But exactly how it happened prior to this essay I wrote, I can't remember. There was, there was no one giving a lecture on you know, the future of computers in high school. <laughs> so I'm speculating on the fact that I just must have read it in mag because I read lots of magazines and newspapers and things like that. So I'm, somehow I was aware, yeah. huh. but very shallowly aware, as you'll see. Because the next guy, which was uh, later that year, Robert Byers, who was my chemistry teacher, said, you seem to have aptitude for science, follow me. And one night, after, one day after school, he took me to Reed College, which is a very good liberal arts college nearby. And he said, here's a computer. Well, this is the, at this point, this is the second one I'd seen. This is a little box with squavy, wavy lines, looked like an oscilloscope. Well, it was an analog computer. And you could do with a patch panel, you could do integration and differential equations and things like that, and see the answer come up on the scope. Now, that didn't interest me all that much. I really wasn't interested in uh, physics and uh, continuous equations and things like that. I was very much more interested in discrete things like uh, first order logic, uh, SQ, which is the equivalent of an SQL database query. Um, you know, the difference between the Dewey Decimal System and the Library of Congress system, that, Congress catalog system, those sorts of things interested me. How do you organize data? <laughs> so when I saw this, we played around with it for a few hours. And I said, okay, I'm done with that. I gotta find me a digital computer. <laughs> so then, um, it, was, so it was very clear to you the difference between analog computing and digital computing from just from that experience. Oh yeah, oh yeah. Now again, I didn't really know what it meant to program a computer. I was sort of guessing that point. But uh, the next thing that happened was my junior year, the very next year, and uh, my high school, Grant High School, had a um, very good reputation in the 50s. 1954 was named the best high school in the United States by somebody, you know, I don't know if it was Life Magazine, who knows. You know, it's one of these uh, popularity contests that are somewhat meaningless. But it was now on the radar screen of the University of Chicago, one of the greatest universities in this country. So they had a National Science Foundation summer program for juniors. And so we got to send four people and uh, my best friend Marty Schnitzer and I got to go back there for two or three months and we each took three classes. And one of my classes was Programming an IBM 7092-7040 in Fortran. 
Okay, so that's where I learned how to program. And the course was taught by the president of the ACM, who was a professor. I think he was actually the president at that time, if, or maybe just a couple years later. Very famous guy, Robert Ashenhurst. And he was actually a professor in the business school because the other problem was, this is 1966 or seven now, there are no computer science departments. Stanford started theirs in 65. Most computer science was done out of mathematics or electrical engineering. And so he, in this case, Ashenhurst was in the business school at Chicago. Um, so I learned how to program and then I, after that I was hooked. So then the next thing happened, the next year my brother came home, he was four years older than me, he had been a student at Williams College back east in Massachusetts. He came home and he said, I'm transferring to Oregon State University, but this summer I'm going to do some programming. And one night he dragged me down to Portland State College, it's now Portland State University in downtown Portland. And he said, here's a 1620 and you can have a hands-on experience. Because at the University of Chicago it was key punch a bunch of cards and submit the deck and come back the next morning. So if you think about debugging cycles today that take place in a matter of seconds or minutes to, change, to find a bug and change one bug, we got to change one or a small cluster of bugs once every 24 hours. Uh, it's either you better not have, you better design your program and not make a lot of obvious mistakes. It really changes the paradigm because to get anything done, you've got to quickly converge to a program that works. Okay, so that's what that was a classic um, uh, punch card operation. But when I got to the 1620, this was you have the whole computer. Now there were no computer screens, and there was still a card reader, but you could put anything you wanted into the card reader, wait until something came back, put it back through. So you could suddenly get a cycle going of debugging every, you know, maybe 10 or 15 minutes instead of once every 24 hours. So it's still not interactive time sharing or you with your PC, but it's, you know, it's just one small step in that direction. So that was a lot of fun. And so your, your brother's name is Mike. Yeah, Michael. So he, so he was also interested in computers. He had, did oh, he yes. get into it before you did or? Is he older or younger than you? He's four years older, and I assume he had learned, again, learned about them prior to this, because uh, he would have been a, about a junior in college at that time. But as far as I know, this course he took uh, at Portland State was his first programming, but he really got hooked. And by the way, he started companies. He started multiple companies just like I did. And he ended up being the largest, both physically and um, uh, in terms of a client base, the largest website developer in Northern Thailand. That was his last company. Um, yeah, he and I are very much alike, you know, very logical, perfect computer science <laughs> candidates. Yeah. So then you went on to uh, college at Oregon State. Right. Um, any reason why you wanted to just stay in state or? Oh, well, I got a, I think my parents wanted me to stay in state because I got accepted to Stanford. Early acceptance. I got early acceptance at Pomona. These are two big name schools. And there had been a whole bunch of uh, riots at Stanford and at Berkeley right before that. Oh, uh, this is during the Vietnam right. era? Right, Vietnam protests. Yeah. Well, it turns out we had them in Oregon State, too, but they didn't know that. <laughs> <laughs> and they came later. Um, so I think they simply didn't want to lose me into the cesspool of California politics and hippiedom, because this was 1968, <laughs> fall of 1968. And it was, things were, yeah, they were a little crazy in those days. And we also had the race riots in all the big cities around the country. Um, and, you know, we really couldn't afford to send me because I didn't get, I was hoping to get, we didn't have the, the, the uh, uh, federal loan programs in those days. It would make it easy to go pretty much anywhere. 
So I didn't get a job or a scholarship, so I was going to have to really work hard and save money and then borrow money from somebody. So it was just easier to go, or, go to Oregon State. And I planned ahead. I said, OK, I'm going to go to Oregon State, and then I'm going to Stanford for graduate school. Now, most people, when you're 18, to say that would be like, including me, would be like, give me a break. You know? <laughs> you're not going to get into Stanford. But I just said, well, that's, that's my plan. And, that, and in fact, it did happen. So, so it worked out well. Did the, um, the, did the sort of the politics of the time, the Cold War, the Vietnam War, affect you or your family any uh, at all? Um, it did not affect me. It actually affected my brother Mike, because when he got out of Oregon State with his master's in mathematics, he was going to be drafted immediately, because he had a deferment. And by 1968 or 9, as soon as you left college, they, they figured out when you turned 19 whether they wanted to draft you or not. And then they deferred you. But as soon as the deferment was up, you were drafted. So the only way he could avoid going to Vietnam was to um, uh, find another deferment. So he moved to Los Angeles, tried out for a singing group up with people. Um, and for whatever reason, he didn't go with them. And, and they, would, they were sponsored by, in part, the Department of State of the federal government. So they would have um, gotten him a deferment. And they would go all around the world for a year. And that was the folk song era. So this was sort of the feel-good side of popular music as opposed to hard rock that was going on in the late 60s. Right. Um, so he didn't do that. So he found a job and he went to work for Lytton Data Systems, which is a defense contractor. And immediately, bingo, he got a job deferment. Right, okay. So if you work for the defense something in the something that helps the war effort you can get into deferment yes, that's okay. right i see so that's what yeah. but it, that none of that affected me because i was in, i was deferred i was in college right okay. okay so yeah let's talk about your work um at oregon state okay uh well i majored in mathematics because as i said nobody had computer science departments although stanford had one there were probably four or five in the country by then um my advisor was a guy named Harry Goheen, um, who was a really great teacher and just a, and a great advisor, great guy, slightly wacky, but, but uh, very good for me. And he was mostly in the theory of computation. And his background is he came from the University of Pennsylvania, where he worked on ENIAC, the first wow. computer. Wow, okay, let's not go down that rat hole. Anyway, <laughs> they claim it was the first computer. But while he was there in 1947, he was one of the founders of the ACM. So he had this rich tradition, even out at Oregon State, of um, innovation in, in computing. So he was my advisor. And then my other advisor was a guy named Arvid Lonseth. And he was actually in, in um, applied mathematics, it's things I wasn't. I mean, I took classes from him and got to know him, and, and we became friends. But the interesting thing was he had been a graduate student with George Forsyth at UCLA. Now, George Forsyth was the founder of the computer science department at Stanford University. And that's actually why I ended up going to Stanford, because I, or at least the initial reason, because I felt I had a connection there. Um, the way I, so I took all sorts, this is when I started taking only computer classes. And even though they were in the math department, there were a few dozen classes. I took them all. Uh, in fact, after the first class that I took the first quarter, which is programming in an interactive uh, programming language called Oscar, of all things, they said, gee, this guy seems to know what he's doing. They asked me to become a lab assistant as a freshman in college. Wow. So I did that. And then after that, the computer center said, well, we want to hire you as a programmer, you know, and why, why be a teacher when you can do real work? <laughs> and I thought, this is a great idea. So I said, yes. And then they said, oh, we're so sorry. We can't um, give you that job yet, but we'll give you this temporary job. And they knew that they would lose me, I think. I don't know. So I became the first male I.O. girl. Huh. Now, this is the, the age of sexism. 
So there was this one job category called I.O. girl, at least that informally, that's what we call them. And basically, they stood behind a counter, and as you brought your decks of cards up, they took them in, handed them to the qualified computer operator, which I was not. And they ran them through the card reader, ripped off the line printer output, came back out, and then you would tie the, the output around the box, put it in an A through Z cubbyhole, and wait for the person to come back and pick them up. So that was the job of the I.O. girl. So I like to say I broke the sex barrier in computer science. <laughs> in a strange way. Uh, in a strange way, yeah. <laughs> well, d I'm, well the, I mean, I guess the, the real question is whether any of those I.O. IO girls advanced to other positions in the computer I center. think so, because I think some of them, some of them not, but some of them were in uh, the same boat I was in. They were trying to become programmers, they were students working part-time, whatever. It was clearly a position you wanted to advance out of right. <laughs> quickly. Right. So I only did that for, I don't know, maybe a couple of months. And then I hit maybe the best job I ever had. And I discovered that I'm not really a long-term researcher where I pick a neat area and I work my whole career in that one area. I'm a problem solver. I guess I would say that I'm a consulting engineer. I like people to bring me problems. I solve their problem, then I move on to the next one. So that keeps me refreshed because it's always, and the problems might have some relationship to past problems that I've worked on, but it's um, just a very stimulating sort of environment. So in a way, um, starting with this next job, my first programming job, that's what I've been for 40 years, 50 years. <clears throat> so so what, what sort of job was this? And you were still an undergrad at the university. This was yes. part, with the lab? With so the this center? is uh, for the Central Computer Center. So again, even in those days, about 1969, we only had maybe a dozen computers on campus. So I programmed for the big mainframe, which was a Control Data Corporation 3300. Uh, that was a time-sharing system? Um, as it came out of the box, it was not. It was a traditional mainframe with card readers. and. But we had an enterprising group of guys under um, a um, staff member named George Rose. And they developed from whole cloth one of the best time-sharing systems in the world called the OS3 or OS cubed, really, open state, open shop operating system. And so we had a couple hundred teletypes scattered around campus, and people didn't need to type in on punch cards any longer. You could type your program in from the teletype, run the program on the mainframe, and get the answers back. So, so I started uh, working for a guy named Ron Davis, and he basically, whenever someone came in with a difficult job, he said, go meet with Brian, and then I would program it up. Or often, they'd have a program that needed to be modified, or maybe even just here's this year's data, run the data, and if it looks like it worked, give it back to me. So I did dozens and dozens of jobs. I worked, while I was a full-time student, I worked anywhere from half to, uh, well, full-time in the summers and during the main year, half time, to three quarters time. So I was, I was pretty busy. And during that time, I got interested in what we talked about earlier, which is data reduction, data analysis. In particular, I worked on sensor data. So I had an application, I listed some of them here. I had a, a system that uh, for the oceanography department where they had sensors every quarter mile starting at the high tide mark of the Pacific Ocean down in Newport the Beach, Oregon. And they went every quarter mile out into the ocean because they were looking at who, what lives in the intertidal zone and what sort of temperatures and what sort of tide flows are there. So they got all, gathered this data and then I had to analyze it basically. So, I mean, they gave me the theoretic alg algorithms, but I had to write the program and actually run it. So that's an example. I had uh, another system that had sensors. Uh, Oregon State has one of the best forestry 
schools in the world because it has a lot of forests. And they put a sensor every 10 feet up a 200 foot tree, again, to see what is the wind like, what are the temperatures like, what animals are living at that level in the tree and so on. And this is in 1969. I mean, this was not done. This was pretty far out stuff. And so I processed that data. I had another database for uh, the DEQ, Department of Environmental Quality of the state of Oregon. And I had uh, a data record on every mile uh, of every river and stream in the entire state. And they would go around with sensors and figure out, they'd also see um, what cities, um, homes, and factories were there that were polluting because we had a horrible polluting problem. In the early 60s, the Willamette River caught on fire. Um, and uh, Oregon became green overnight. That is, we decided that that's a bad thing. How do we fix it? And this database was one of the ways we fixed it. We tracked every polluter, and we could tell if there was a paper mill pumping out polluted water from their paper making process, I could tell you every mile from that mill down 200 miles how much pollution was still in the water as it got sifted out. And so that allowed the state to say, we got to close that company down or have uh, more uh, pollution controls or what have you. Um, I had another database with a, a record on every quarter mile of state highway. That was more for maintenance purposes. They would go around and say, this concrete's breaking down. Within the next five years, we've got to repave, that sort of thing. So uh, this was sort of the era when computers were starting to be put into use in every walk of life, not just big banks and uh, you know, nuclear labs and things like that. What sorts of languages were you writing these programs in? Mostly in Fortran, Fortran 4. You know. That was the go-to language. I mean, I knew many other languages. Um, Algol, COBOL, BASIC, this homegrown interactive language that I think was based in part on BASIC. It was called OSCAR, the Oregon State Conversational Aid to Research. Um, but yeah, I think pretty much everything I did was at Oregon State was in basic. It was in uh, Fortran. You know, it, it was the best scientific language. It was efficient and. Um, is there anything else you want to talk about during your undergrad? Um, um, no, I think that's that's. Uh, oh yeah, how did I get into AI? Yeah. Very important. Oregon State didn't do artificial intelligence. I mean, no, really, nobody did. So even though I said there were 20 classes I took, there were no AI classes. So this um, rather famous mathematician, Emilio Gagliardi, Gagliardo, came over from Italy and spent five years at Oregon State. And he gave a graduate seminar in pattern recognition, and I took that. And then I was hooked not only on computers and programming, but on artificial intelligence. And that was pretty basic artificial intelligence, but still, compared to what I had been doing, it was like night and day. I mean, dump in data and find hyperplanes. So basically, um, 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 what's it called? Uh, just bottom up um, learning. And trying to figure out, it's basically cluster, cluster creation. I see. And it was, I mean, pattern recognition was, was already considered a field, a subfield of AI at that, at that time. Well, okay. Now you get into um, the uh, philosophy. There are lots of different decision-making technologies. And they often have started up in different departments. And so the double E people would say, that's just a double E um, technique. But AI certainly embraced it because it was a way to do machine learning. A fairly primitive one, but perhaps the first one. But uh, so 
you know, I'm not, uh, I, I wouldn't say it's yet definitely artificial intelligence or not, because other people would say it's not. Right. At least. But did you understand yourself to be, when you took that course, and what got you excited about that course was, uh, like what about it got you excited? And did you understand that uh, what you were doing as AI at the time? Ah, that's, that's an important question. Yes, I think so. I think the course was not called AI, but I think it came up that there's this field of artificial intelligence. This is the only thing we do in it here at Oregon State. So yes. Right. So, so you did see that this was, oh, that course put you, put you, made you aware of the field yes, of AI. Absolutely. Okay. And in fact, uh, that was my junior year. And the next, that summer, I bought my first car, a uh, lime green 71 Camaro. And my best friend and I drove to Tijuana, mostly to just test out the car. Um, but along the way, we stopped at Stanford because a guy who had been at Oregon State with my older brother, Mike, Lynn Quam, now worked at the Stanford Artificial Intelligence Laboratory. So I said, I'm next year I have to apply for graduate school. So I went and met with him and he gave me a tour of the AI lab. And then I was really hooked because there were robots that moved and arms and, and cameras that produced digital data that got analyzed and all sorts of weird. I mean, there were uh, automated vending machines. <clears throat> so you could um, go up to the vending machine type on a computer your, your uh, name and password, and it would open the thing up. You'd take a Coke out, and it would send you a bill at the end of the month. <laughs> so we had a lot of toys, really cute toys. And I'll come back to one of them later, because it ended up being key to what I did later. So yeah, so he, these things are very incremental. Learning about computers, programming, pattern recognition, AI. You know, and just I just every year learn something new. There was nobody that said you need to go on artificial intelligence. In fact, some of my advisors were saying you don't need to go to Stanford, go to a good database school or someplace. You know, Ohio State or I can't remember where they wanted me to go. And I thought, but 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 they don't do AI. So Okay, so then you uh, so then you applied to Stanford and you had this connection with Professor Lonseth already. Yeah, but you know, I mean, he just wrote a letter of recommendation. I mean, so I got accepted. Went down to Stanford in '72, and Stanford just sort of took everything at Oregon State to another level. Not only did it have not only AI, but it had the most funding in that area of, of all the areas that Stanford had going, but it had the best person, you know, other than maybe somebody at MIT or Carnegie Mellon, had the best person in every field in the country. So it was like a kid in a candy shop taking classes for the first couple of years. Um, you know, we had, I learned a lot from Don Knuth, um, Bob Floyd, and uh, Ed McCluskey in uh, hardware design and computer architectures, which I didn't go into, but it was like another view of the computing substrate, if you will. So I really enjoyed um, him. Plus, they're all characters. It goes with the territory. If you're in computing and you're that smart, you're always a little quirky. Present company accepted, of course. Um, so yeah, so I loved um, taking classes from these guys. My advisors, my, uh, you had an academic advisor. My first year was Harold Stone because I had declared um, that I was in software systems, not in AI yet. I went there with the National Science Foundation Fellowship, so I didn't need any funding. I, I was self-funded. In fact, I think, I'm not sure if it was that reason or not, but, uh, or just my interest in AI, but I got a call from Ed Feigenbaum that summer saying, come to work for me, which I didn't do, maybe I should have, but uh, by then I'd already seen, been at the AI lab and I said, do you have any robots that move around? No, no, we don't do robots. We do expert systems. I said, oh, that's, that's not as exciting. <laughs> it's funny, you know, when you're 18, or no, I guess I was 21 then. Um, 
think, you know, how you make decisions that do affect your life. Although, as you'll see, Ed had a big effect on me. In fact, that's really why I'm here today, because of Ed Feigenbaum. Okay, so um, my first advisor was Harold Stone. He was in um, software systems and computer architectures. And after a year, he left Stanford, and they randomly assigned me to an interesting guy named Vint Cerf. <laughs> and I wasn't in networking at all, so I interacted with him and knew him really well. He's still a friend of mine. Uh, but I, you know, I was not going to do a networking thesis again. Maybe a uh, opportunity missed. I don't know. <laughs> but I started working with a guy that year named Cordell Green, and he was a hardcore AI guy. He had been a um, student of John McCarthy's in the 60s. He got his PhD at the AI lab and also working at SRI International. And he won the uh, Grace Murray Hopper Award as the best computer scientist under age 30 for something called QA3, Question Answering 3. And he showed how you could use first order predicate logic to not only prove theorems, but simulate programs, um, automatically create programs, uh, prove that programs are correct. I mean, it's sort of like he took John McCarthy's ideas and created a whole field, which actually then led to my PhD thesis, thesis among other things. So he was very seminal. So one of those areas was called program verification. That became a whole sub-area of uh, mathematical computation, theory of computation and AI. But another area is automatic programming, which then became an area called program synthesis, which is around today. And Cordell's group is still in Palo Alto. It's called the Kestrel Institute. So we had uh, DARPA funding, and we had a very large project called the Psi system that went from 74 to 79, roughly. And seven PhD theses came out of that. Mine was one of seven. The idea was you should not need to have a programming language to program a computer. You should be able to type in English sentences. It should ask you a few questions, and eventually it writes the program for you. It does all the, the, uh, the dirty work. Well, it turns out. Even today, that's easier said than done. So uh, we spent uh, years um, doing that. And it was successful, but a very big and ponderous system. But the work's continued for, for decades. Um, so that's a nice, niche. It's a very small niche, but an important niche in artificial intelligence and in programming languages and tools as well. I mean, so was it the, so you, you mentioned that it was successful, so were, the ideas were sound, but maybe the, the implementations were just too slow? Or yeah, what was the well, a couple of things. One is that the vision was so vast. I mean, going from natural language statements, English statements about a program, to optim super optimized code. That's why there were like seven PhD theses along the way. Um, we were running, we couldn't even run this program on the PDP-10 at sale at the AI lab. So we ran it on PDP-10s down at uh, the Information Science in Institute of USC. And they were, it was all built in, um, uh, well, it wasn't common, it was, I guess Interlisp, which is a system that came out of BBN and then transferred to Xerox PARC when PARC was started around 1970. Each one of these programs was like a million words of memory, and there were like seven of them interacting. So <clears throat> we only ran it a couple of times as a complete end-to-end -end system, and it was slow. I mean, we took over an entire multi-million dollar computer, and it ran for hours, and it worked, yes. Yeah. So um, from a research point of view, we, we think we proved the case. But it was ponderous and so on and so forth. So in fact, um, at uh, Systems Control, the next company, we started a new follow-on program called CHI, C-H-I. Uh, a guy named Jorge Phillips, another graduate student, started that. And that created the interactive refinement technique, where you use predicate um, statements 
and then the system automatically refines those into further and further uh, detailed refinements of predicate language, predicate logic, and eventually it starts turning into procedural code. And that worked. I mean, that was efficient. So, so the, evol the next generation really was, uh, in some sense, more practical. Ultimately, why do you think that idea ha still hasn't caught on? Of um, well, I think program. the main problem, it's related to what we were talking about the last two days in this expert systems uh, workshop that the Computer History Museum has uh, uh, sponsored. It's a big, big problem. <laughs> computer program. I tell people, computer programming is perhaps the um, richest intellectual exercise and the least forgiving intellectual exercise there is. So to think, so if you're doing artificial intelligence research, it's not where you start. Uh, it's sort of like you don't start by saying, I want to build a computer system that writes the top novel of the year that will win the Pulitzer Prize. That's not where you start. That's stuff that most people can't do. <laughs> so it was just a very, very hard problem, and it still is. Um, so then your, so where's your dissertation uh, on this topic? Yeah, I was yeah. on something called the Program Model Builder which sat in the middle of this, this big system, and you input natural language, uh, full sentences, those got parsed into smaller chunks. My model builder assembled those into a, a pro, an executable program in what is called a very high level language, a set oriented language. And then from there, we had systems that refined, this is the early version of the refinement process, refined the high level statements down into uh, executable, uh, well, actually it was Lisp in those days. And they also, there was another model that tried, it was basically Don Knuth in a bottle. It, it tried to look at each piece of the program as it was being refined and tried to assess which implementation technique. So if what you needed was a linked list, it might have five ways to implement linked lists, but it needs to know how often do you look something up, how often do you add something, because the optimal code will depend on which of those operations is most frequent. So that's why I say that's the sort of the stuff that Don Knuth analyzes rigorously in uh, the analysis of algorithms, work that he pioneered. Okay, so then, um, you, so you graduate in 1978? Well, I graduated or, at the end of 79. Uh, end of 79. Now, let okay. me mention one thing that happened along the way. Uh -huh. As I mentioned, John McCarthy liked toys because he felt if you had smart computers and smart people and lots of sensors and lots of robots, some bright graduate students can figure out what to do with them, right? So he got the Associated Press to give us the first real-time link of AP articles. So every time an AP article came, it used to be in, in a newsroom, the article would get typed out on a typewriter, teletype, and you'd rip it off, take it over, and they'd retype it and put it into their typesetting system if they wanted, if the newspaper wanted to run that article. Well, we just dumped them all into a big text database. So <clears throat> then John worked with a guy named Martin Frost, who wrote an application to do uh, keyword queries against this database. That was called the News uh, Service Application, or NS for short. I became a power user of NS, so I knew what was good about it and what was wrong about it, and, and it will come up later why that was turned out to be important. Okay. So it had nothing to do, it was, it was John's idea of let kids play and good things will, will happen. And this did happen, although it happened after I'd graduated. Okay. But that was something that you were sort of doing on your spare time while in the AI. Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, I basically, I read the newspaper. I didn't read a newspaper. When I got to the AI lab, which unfortunately it was like at 10, 30, or 11 in the morning, <laughs> because we worked all night right. to get more cycles on the computer, yeah. 
um, first thing I'd do is read my email, and then I would um, read the news service. And I had some standing queries about things like artificial intelligence, and I don't know what else I was interested in, maybe sports teams. And so I developed this set of queries, and every morning I would see what was there, and that essentially gave me a custom newspaper to read. Now this was in 1973, so a long time ago. I mean, nobody had the data. Yeah. It's sort of like the, uh, a lot of the machine learning that's, we talked about this yesterday. A lot of these algorithms existed in the 50s and 60s. There was either no data, or if there was enough data to make the algorithm converge to a reasonable answer, the computers were not fast enough to process that much data. Um, so we had the data. We had the Associated Press Newswire, which in those days was fairly robust. It had maybe a few hundred articles per day covering all sorts of topics. So then next you go to Systems Control Incorporated? Yeah, so what happened is in my thesis advisor, Cordell Green, decided to leave Stanford. Our project was part of John McCarthy's overall um, grant um, from DARPA, Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, although in those days it was probably only called ARPA. Um, so Cordell went to DARPA and they said, yes, we'll continue to fund you. Let's find you a home. And we found a home at Systems Control, Inc. Now, the reason we found a home there is that Ed Feigenbaum and his wife Penny Nee had two years earlier moved, or about no, just a little bit or maybe a year earlier, moved, no, I take it back, it was longer than that. I'm not sure what date, but before 78. They had taken a project where they applied the Hearsay 2 um, blackboard system or architecture in artificial intelligence that came out of the Hearsay Speech Understanding System at Carnegie Mellon University, and they were applying it to SOSIS data. SOSIS data are these undersea um, microphones that the U.S. scattered around the oceans to try to pick up noises from Russian submarines during the Cold War. So the idea was you could use the Hearsay 2 architecture. Instead of listening to someone talk and typing out a sentence of what they said, you would listen to all these sensors and put up on a graphic screen a map of what's moving and label it submarine, um, whale, unknown, U.S. submarine, Russian, you know, whatever. However well you could identify that object from the, the array of acoustic sensors. So that was being done at Systems Control Inc. or SCI. And I think that's one of the reasons <clears throat> that was on the, um, and that was funded by DARPA. So DARPA said, well, why don't you move there? And we did. Um, and uh, I don't know, one of the things I did there while I was there, we wrote a proposal to the National Science Foundation joint between SCI and um, the Karma Group. Computer, see, Karma stands for Center for Computer Research on Music and Acoustics. And it was started by two friends of mine, John Chowning and Leland Smith. And this NSF grant, again, was way, way ahead of its time. The idea was put, put two microphones up and have a cellist and a violinist play a duet for 30 seconds. Now, the computer is going to munch on that acoustic data and spit out the score. Now, Mozart could do this for entire symphonies with 100 players, and the symphony went for 30 minutes. We found it very hard to do it for two instruments and, you know, 30 seconds of data. So, but, you know, you have to start somewhere. Yeah. Um, my friend Joe Rockmore, who started in 78 all the way through 2013, was essentially my closest colleague. He actually ran that project. Um, and I mentioned, um, oh, and I mentioned SIAP. SIAP was this program that Ed Feigenbaum brought over. And another friend of mine, Bob Drazovich, actually two friends, Bob and Roland Payne, 
ran that project. Well, in 78, I was still finishing my thesis. So then what happened is, in August of 79, the boss of this group, the boss of Cordell Green, left as Systems Control Inc. And he came back and started talking to someone. He said, I'm going to start a new company. We're going to do decision systems. So that's artificial intelligence, databases, control and estimation theory, pattern recognition, decision analysis, databases. It's all the different types of algorithms that you can automate in a computer to help people either to automatically make decisions or to help people make decisions. So AI was starting to get hot then. This is 1979. But it wasn't a pure AI company. In fact, there were five founders, Bob Drazich and Roland Payne, Dick Wishner, the principal founder, myself, and then a guy named Edison Say, who was a professor in the engineering economic systems department at Stanford. And he didn't do AI at all. And Dick really didn't do AI. He did control systems, estimation systems. So we thought, once again, if you smash all these different technologies together and you start bringing in problems to solve, we will come up with innovative solutions. Now, it turns out that I would say 70 or 80% of what we did was artificial intelligence but not exclusively. And I think we're one of the few places that had experts in all these other uh, fields. Um, so this was advanced decision systems. Yeah, so this was, um, in 1979, we started a company called AI and DS, Advanced Information and Decision Systems. <clears throat> People started calling it AIDS in 1980, and within a couple of years, the AIDS epidemic started going. So we realized that, in fact, people would see on my card, I was from AIDS, and I had a PhD, and they'd, on a plane back from Washington, they'd ask me about how the epidemic's going. So we actually changed, I mean, it got pretty ludicrous. So we changed the name from Advanced Information and Decision Systems to just Advanced Decision Systems. And we didn't do that until about 80 four, I think, maybe, 83, 84. Um, um, one quick question. Did you, yes. during this time, you know, um, while you were working on um, your dissertation and, at, and then at SCI and then starting ADS, did you understand your work to be part of ex expert systems? Oh, that's a good question. Yes, that's a very good question. So, um, Just as now, in research fields, there are different uh, groups of interest and camps and uh, wars, if you will. I mean, they're, they're uh, intellectual battles. Uh, what, what is the right approach? And uh, at Stanford, we had two groups. Uh, Ed Feigenbaum's group, which was called the Heuristic Programming Project, and later the Knowledge Systems Laboratory. And then we had the Stanford AI lab under John McCarthy. Early on in the 60s, they were actually together. And then Ed, as he realized he wanted to do these expert systems, he, and he separated out. Now, even though I was at the Stanford AI lab, where we were doing robotics, vision, speech understanding, uh, natural language understanding, um, music generation and understanding, and program synthesis, if you looked at a lot of the technologies in there, it really was, if not expert systems technology, it was knowledge-based systems technology. That is, it was the same technology, but we, and it had, there was knowledge in those systems, but the knowledge was um, gleaned by the, the, engine, the researchers themselves. They didn't go to someone else and say, how should I understand this image of blocks stacked on a, on a uh, table. They just figured it out from first principles. So I would say it wasn't, those were not expert systems. Those were um, knowledge-based systems, but the distinction's fairly minor. So yes, I would say we were doing expert systems. This whole size system really 
was attempting to encode the expertise of what it takes to describe an algorithm in English and turn out optimal code from it. It looks like that's really an expert system, except it's an expert system where we were the experts. Right. We, were, we were some of the best programmers around, so we just intuited from our own experiences what the system should do. And you mentioned, you mentioned, you mentioned Ed Feigenbaum. You, you were working with Cordell Green, but yes. not directly with Ed Feigenbaum. But, That's right. But what yes. influence did Ed have on the work that you guys were doing? Well, it was, I mean, he gave talks. It was in the ether. Everyone knew about all these approaches, as we knew about Hearsay 2, which was actually being done at that time at Carnegie Mellon University. We knew about work at MIT, and, and uh, University of Edinburgh really was the fourth big center. In those days, as today, AI can chew up lots of cycles. I mean, that's why we're, we're suddenly seeing deep learning work, because there's data and lots of computing power available. We didn't have that in the 60s and 70s. So DARPA said we want to, it's a strategic um, technology for the defense of the country during the Cold War, but we can't allow every university to have a $10 million computer, so we'll pick a few winners. So they gave Carnegie Mellon, MIT, and Stanford 10-year grants, multi-million dollar grants every year for 10 years, and, and they basically said, make us be the best in AI in the world. That's what happened. Of course, they picked the smartest people in the world, the guys that started the field in the 50s. Um, John McCarthy, Marvin Minsky, and uh, Alan Newell and Herb Simon at Carnegie, Carnegie Mellon University. Um, so yeah, I would say, certainly in program synthesis, we thought we were doing expert systems. And certainly when we got to doing SIAP at systems control, even though Ed was no longer involved, we were definitely doing an expert system. They would actually go down and talk to what are called loafergram analysts at Moffett Field, because they were flying these P3s and looking for submarines off the coast of the United States. And they were experts that knew how to find Soviet submarines. So they actually went and talked to those experts. So that was a classic, uh, well, it wasn't even a classic expert system because it's a hybrid. One of the reasons for using a hearsay two or blackboard model is that you have a central blackboard where you post results or hypotheses. And eventually, what's left on that blackboard is the answer. Sort of like you had an equation and different students came up to the blackboard, started working on the equation. When you're all done, there's an answer. So a lot of people contributed. There was only one blackboard. When you're all done, what's left is the answer. Now, in our case, what you have is knowledge sources, and these knowledge sources can be expert systems. They can be database lookup. They can be sensors that are sending in data, um, interaction with a human. Uh, so it's a very general um, problem-solving paradigm because you can integrate all sorts of data and all sorts of algorithms. So that, that is a classic expert system uh, for very hard problems. If you have simpler problems, using something like Emison production rules is much better. And we'll get back to that because that's the way I went with my search engine. Okay. So those are the sort of the two problem-solving paradigms that I used, essentially, in my career. So then getting back to ADS, um, so was it, I mean, a lot of the work that you did was for DARPA or the Defense Department. Was that part of, the, did, was the company targeting that specifically? Was that just the kinds of bi the, the business that was coming up? Um, Two answers. One, we were targeting it because we knew those people. I'd worked for DARPA since 1972 at Stanford. We'd all, and then the SIAP thing was for DARPA. Right. Oh, because all your research in, in graduate school was yes. being funded by yeah, DARPA. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the whole AI lab, or 95% of the AI lab was DARPA funded. So that was a natural. But here, the more important reason is the following. There were expert system shell and expert system uh, consulting companies sprouting up 
and we had all of them here yesterday at the expert systems workshop. And their goal was to sell their shell, sell their consulting, go out into corporate America and make money building expert systems for that. That was not our goal. We didn't want to solve today's problem. We wanted to do applied research and prototyping to solve much, much harder problems. Now, it wasn't basic research. We wanted to be driven by real problems. But it was a different, it's more like the DARPA model. You know, there's basic research, there's go build me, a low, um, a low risk application. And then there's all this stuff in between called applied research, advanced prototyping, uh, proof of principle systems. And that's where we wanted to be. And actually for the first five years, that's where we were. Then we started, some of those things started working. So then people said, well, it will be a real system. So for the last half of the eight years, I started building operational prototypes and operational systems for the government. But we started by building, doing the research and building the prototypes and proving that the basic idea was sound. You know, if you can prove an idea is sound for $500,000, why spend $10 million beating your, you know, trying to build it and maybe failing? So it's a nice phased approach to doing uh, um, injection of new technologies, right. shall we say, right. into the world. So we actually had a different business model. In fact, we were self-funded. We had no venture capital, no outside funders. There were five founders. We each put in, I think, five or ten thousand dollars cash. And I think later we had some problems. We each had to put in another few thousand. And that was it. Uh, because then we started immediately getting contracts, and that paid our salaries, and we kept growing. We went from five people to 200, 200 plus three spinoffs. <laughs> well, it, that was over a uh, 12-year period, so right. it's not. But it started with nothing. Okay. Yeah, so we're talking about ADS. And, oh, yeah, so we're going to start with the, the first project or the first right. client, mm -hmm. I guess. Uh, the first thing that we did as a company, the first system we built, there were some studies that we were also doing. So often you, you're paid to do a study for six months, and then they say, that's a great idea. So study often is a paid proposal. We'll give you $50,000, you write us a proposal for $5 million, and then with 50000 you better know what you're doing, and then we'll say yes or no. But the first actual system we built was something called the radar target classification or RTC system. And it internally looked exactly like PSYOP and Hearsay 2, at least initially. So it was a blackboard system. So the idea was take the same old AI architecture, actually new architecture, and apply it to the problem of understanding what are called in ISAR, inverted synthetic aperture radar images. And uh, this was a new technology, and it can look out over the horizon. So the idea was that the Navy would be able to put this new type of radar on their ships, and if there's something, someone coming at them hundreds of miles away, you could still, you would see them before they could see and shoot at you, basically. But it's a difficult problem because the, the images that come out are smeared. I can show you examples of them. And so you need, again, knowledge of different types to understand. Like you need, in the end, um, you, you boiled up all this information from the images as well as the ancillary information. Then you had a library of all the different ships and you matched your hypothesis of this image against you know, a library of potentially all the ships, large ships in the world. And you'd say, which ship is it? Now there's a problem with that. That's, by the way, that's called model-based um, because these ship models, it's actually not just a library, they're actual models, 3D models. And so you're matching the model of each ship type to the model that you have intuited from the data and to see how, which one matches. Sometimes they're very close. Sometimes it's like, well, I can get it down to one of these three ships or classes of ships. So that's the first thing we did, and we, 
that was proven to work. I'm not sure it was deployed because in those days, you know, it had to be built by someone and put on the ships, and we, we didn't do that. So that, that was the first thing. The reason I mention it is that, one, it was technically successful, and two, it was a direct follow-on from the SIAP work that Bob Drazovich and uh, Roland Payne had done. In fact, they ran this program, not me. I just helped um, in ancillary ways. You mentioned the Blackboard architecture. I'm not very familiar with that. Could yes. you maybe explain that in, um, in a, just a couple of sentences? Yeah, sure. It's basically a central um, data structure on which you place you, meaning uh, surrounded by a number of not what are called knowledge sources, but they're basically separate algorithms with a very simple interface. And these algorithms are allowed to look at data inside this blackboard and do some computation and then put new data back out. Now the data, it starts out, it's low level data, but what you put back out is the intermediate level hypotheses. And someone else looks at that intermediate level hypothesis and says, here's a higher level. So you can work from something like an ISAR image, but end up with a node that says, this is a Soviet cruiser. So it's basically a, um, um, shared memory with a particular format that allows you to, to share the sorts of data you need to share. So it's sort of like a collaborative form of collecting knowledge. It's a collaborative form of, uh, managing the problem solving process when you don't have a single algorithm that can solve the process. So you need separate knowledge sources. Um, I, I, an easier example would be in hearsay too in speech. You have some knowledge sources that know about phonemes and some that know about words and some that know about sentences. Well, the sentence guy doesn't want to get around until come on, do anything until the word um, knowledge source has said, here's a word and here's another word. And then the sentence guy can come and say, oh, that looks like. Oh, okay, I see. So if you have like, if you have things that are sort of layered or multi-level, but that depend on something lower, right. then the lower right. thing works first and then the next thing comes and takes right. the outputs of the lower thing. And right, then... but it can go the other way too. Someone could say, you just said, um, I saw the blank. He could say, I think it's going to be, I saw the ball, because that's the sentence I'm expecting. Does anyone, if you go back down and look at the signal, can you tell me that the person actually said ball? And sometimes that uh, top-down processing is usually faster than bottom-up, because it's goal-directed, it's focused. So this is a very, very general problem-solving architecture. It allows you to do bottom-up, top-down, or both bottom-up, top-down. In fact, you, you know, usually there's something called a meta controller that controls which knowledge source is called upon next. And this is because the computers were so slow and we didn't have parallel machines, so we couldn't just sort of do everything. So you had to, um, you had to control the order in which these processors worked. Because if you did it in the wrong order, one processor might be so slow it would never, I mean one knowledge source, that it would never come back. It would never produce a result. <coughs> now, I should mention that this is such a generic architecture that it's good for doing the R&D. It's actually poor for delivering a system because it's inefficient. So what you end up doing is finding out which of these control paths was actually used for different classes of problems and then somehow compiling that in so that everything runs faster. Um, but when you don't know the right control architecture, and, but you want to see if your algorithms are working, this is pro probably the most general architecture one can think of. Yeah. So um, then the next thing that you worked on was the t um, rubric or? Uh, yeah. 
Would you like me to talk about that next or finish the signal stuff? Or let's or? finish the... Yeah, why don't we do that? Finish, finish that okay, first. the next signal system uh, was called ASTA, the, Asso uh, the Associate for Science and Technology Analysis. And that's, a, that's government speak. What it really was, was a um, system to model and reverse engineer radar systems. So, we mentioned before that the over the horizon radar was a big advantage because you could see the enemy before they could see you. If you blow that up into multiple year increments, you want to know what the Soviets are going to deploy two years from now in terms of radar technology, because maybe they've got a better radar. And if you actually got into a conflict and you got within 100 miles, and that used to be far enough away that they couldn't see you, and suddenly they can see you, yeah. or they can also shoot at you. So it becomes really important to the Navy, where they have these ships that are worth billions of dollars, to know what does the other guy have. Now, the way they do this is they intercept the radar signals that the enemy is emitting, typically from a, a test platform on land or eventually a sea trial where they, they don't build it permanently on the ship, but they just install it there temporarily. So you can sort of see that it's a, a test radar, essentially. Um, so you, you start intercepting the signal. You fly by and take photos of the of the actual uh, antenna, because now you, you can tell how big the aperture of it is, what type of radar it is, and whether the antenna is rotating or if it's a all digital radar. Um, and then you might get information, like someone might steal or hand you a copy of the radar manual. <laughs> so, you know, there are all sorts of um, ways that this information can come in. Some of it's textual, some of it's signal intercept, some of it's photograph. So this immediately, um, in, in our case, um, you could say, well, you could do that in a um, hearsay um, architecture. But what we wanted to do was have a, um, a constraint-based system. So we built it in the MRS language, which Mike Genezareth developed at Stanford University. He was a professor at Stanford. And he consulted for us on how to use his inference engine. And the key thing about his inference engine was that you could run inferences forward and backward. So if someone said, um, um, I know that the radar has a certain pulse repetition rate, you could put that data in and then let the system infer everything it could from that. Or if someone said, uh, I know that this radar is used for a certain purpose or has a certain aperture, you put that in and let it ripple. So it's a very flexible inference engine for, we could have used a hearsay two architecture, but we didn't need to go quite um, to that level of generality. Okay. What, so, so by constraint, what do you mean by a constraint-based system and what? Okay. What, 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 a radar why? has a number of subsystems. Uh -huh. And the goal is to tie down what each of those subsystems, what design approach. There are only so many ways to build a klystron tube, so many ways to build an antenna. Now, if somebody came up with a brand new one and we didn't have, we couldn't, we probably could not discover it because we weren't doing learning. This is strictly a you know knowledge-based system. But the idea is, if you could constrain one subsystem, the radar, in a certain way, it might then constrain what you know about a different subsystem, and around you go. So as you get more information incrementally, and this process might take years, by the way, you put in each new piece of information, and you see where you are. And hopefully, eventually, it pops out and says, oh, this is a blah, blah radar. We've seen it before, or whatever, or we've been expecting it, or it's just like a radar that we've been testing. That's more typical. You know, it's a race. So we know about a lot of things because our radar people are designing the same sort. So basically, this knowledge base was a knowledge base of design rules about how to design an arbitrary radar. 
And the goal was to feed it information and incrementally constrain the space of all radars down to it's this radar. So that's why I call it a constraint-based system. And the advantage of this over the, I guess, the hearsay style system was? Well, it's more efficient. If you can do it the way we did, it's just simply more efficient. Hearsay is the most general architecture. And if you don't know anything better, that's probably where you want to start. But you already had a, you know this is a constrained space. But we, yeah, we understood that it's a fairly constrained space. We're not going to be adding, I mean, a radar is a radar. It's pretty, pretty well understood. So we're not, we're not, we didn't think we were going to be seeing something or having a new source of data that would require a new knowledge source. So it really just wasn't warranted to do the full uh, hearsay architecture. So we built that, we tested it out, and this is an interesting story that came up yesterday. We built it for the Navy, and the Air Force found out about it, and they said, we want it, and then the Army found out about it. Now it's running in M MRS, which is based in LISP, and at some point they said, okay, we're done with the research, deploy this thing. Well, the Air Force, the Army, and the Navy each had different types of computers. They weren't gonna change. None of the computers ran the LISP language. So they asked for a quote, how do you port this from Lisp to C or something worse? I'm not, I, I don't even think it was C in those days. Were they using ADA by that point? No, that was before ADA had rolled out. Yes, that's a good question. This was uh, mid 80s. I don't know when ADA went live, probably late, eight, maybe late 80s. Um, and so we, event, we tried to convince them not to do that, but eventually we gave them a quote and I think at that point, um, they said that, you know, it's too much money, it's not programmed, we needed to program that amount five years earlier, and so the whole thing sort of blew up. Which is sad, because they wanted it, we'd proven it worked, but, you know, there was some budgetary and bureaucratic restraints, but also technical, that is, how do you get a sophisticated uh, inference engine into practical use. And that's still a problem today because the language and the tools you use to do the research typically are not the ones you want to use to deploy a, such a complex system. And I don't think that problem's really gone away. And in this, in this case, we failed. Or, I mean, we, the, the government and ADS failed because we didn't get to go to the next step, which is, uh, Unfortunate. Okay, then the next uh, system was um, advanced signal processing uh, computer. And the idea here was that the government had, uh, I can't say much about it because it's a classified system, so, uh, but I want to get to the punchline uh, because it's important for the context of the history of expert systems. The idea was there were these signals that were being collected and there were rooms full of people with a little bit of computer front end processing that were pouring over these signals trying to figure out which ones are of interest. Because you know maybe one one hundredth of one percent of all the signals every day are ones that some PhD needs to look at and do something further with. Everything else is sort of like garden, vanilla, no big deal. Well, you know, at some point when you have hundreds of people doing this, you're spending a lot, and even though these people may be enlisted military people or hired contractors without PhDs, you know, it's still a lot of money. So they said, can you do anything to help uh, automate the front end? And so that's what we did. We built a little expert system that did the, the front 75% of that job. So, and we built it for a million dollars and five or six years later, I went back and they said, so far you've saved us half a billion. So it's a 500 to one return on investment. Now, which is, they were very happy, let me tell you. <laughs> they just saved five, $499 million. But it's an example of what, where expert systems can play. If you have some expertise at the level of a, um, a doctor or a, a professor or a technical expert, and you can bottle it up and hand it out to a lot of people. Like, if you could take mice in uh, that 
does blood infectious disease diagnosis and give it to doctors or even nurses in Africa, which we could not do, unfortunately, in the 70s, that could be a big, that'd be an analogous win, right? Uh, but the idea of just creating mycin so that existing MDs can use it doesn't make any sense because then those MDs already know all that. So here's an example where you could actually get to a bottom line return on investment calculation, which is what corporations like to do and even the Defense Department likes to do. So this is an example of one of those um, uh, systems with a real number attached to it. There are others in the Defense Department in the logistics area. Well, take it back. Those don't have the numbers associated with it. What they have is the speed and quality of the logistics. Like, how do you move 300,000 soldiers in one month from here to Kuwait? That's a, that was a real problem before Desert Storm. And they solved it. So that's a, you can't put a price tag on that. I mean, the, the real, the real win is we won the war. <laughs> so. Okay, so those are the signal analysis systems. And these, <coughs> so, so these, so you worked on these sort of in succession and then uh, simultaneously with these other things that were Yeah, that's going? right. Right. RTC was in the early 80s, ASP was in the mid 80s, ASPIC was in the mid and late 80s. And then in parallel with all that, we did text understanding. So I really had sort of two foci, if you will. So um, how did the text understanding stuff come, come about? Okay. Now, I mentioned the news service systems. I already was an expert user at sort of the state of the art. Then in 1981, the government said, well, we're getting more and more text in terms of these reports that we, our people write. Um, user's manuals for radars, uh, uh, email, what they would call cable traffic coming from overseas um, bases and, and uh, companies. And you know, most of the world's data really is in text, high-level data, uh, human processable data. So they said, what can you do? Because we can look at the data as it comes in, but if someone says a year later, what happened a year ago? We can never find the report or the, or the message or the cable traffic on that. So I got to thinking about the news service system, and I thought it really didn't work because it was just keywords. But then I started thinking about mycin and emycin, um, which is a um, rule-based system, production rules, with weights um, on each rule. And so if you could process documents with a set of rules with predefined weights, you could actually create a dynamic weight for each document with respect to the topic area or the concept area that that set of rules defines. And so we did a, we got a contract and did a test of that and it worked beautifully. I mean, the what is called in uh, the search space, uh, precision and recall, I can show you a graph, was like almost perfect for a small test case. And, and these were t the techniques that were done in Mycin had come out of, where had they been pioneered initially? Uh, Mycin was in the Knowledge Systems Laboratory. It was a Ed's guy named Ted Shortliff. Okay. And he worked um, in Ed's lab. He didn't actually work directly for Ed. He worked with uh, Bruce Buchanan, who was Ed's uh, deputy. So I knew that work, and then after Ted Shortliff's thesis in the early 70s, a guy named Bill Van Melle built e mycin, which was empty or essential mycin, which was the production rule engine with an editor that allowed you to put your own production rules in. So I thought, gee, if I had e mycin, I mean, my, my notion was I'll take rid of the, get rid of the news service, keep the AP line coming in, and put e mycin on there and type in my own rules, and suddenly, Everything's going to be wonderful, and, and it was. It worked. So really simple idea from sort of... Now, Bill Van Malley was one of my housemates at Stanford, so this is, gets into the sociology of Silicon Valley. We had this one house from 
74 to 80. And it had three bedrooms, so there were always three computer science students living in this house. And they, the first three were there, and then they, some of them graduated, and Bill and Lyle Ramshaw and I moved in. So I knew Bill, I knew about his thesis. So I, I just sort of, you know, so I knew about that, and I knew about the news service. So I, I came up with this system, and <laughs> amazingly, it worked beautifully. So we just kept um, working on it. We had to scale up the knowledge base, the, the, I'm sorry, the database. So a guy named Vic Askman oh, was a database guru. So he created a um, inverted file structure so we could store all the text files with a handle for those and then uh, essentially index those by every keyword in the text. And then our emycin would only go against this uh, index file of all the keywords. So basically you had every keyword that existed in any document, one or more documents. And for that keyword, you had a list of the document numbers or handles um, that had that keyword in it. So it's basically just an index. So you never had to look at the documents again. I mean, all, almost all text systems work that way. Um, so we scaled up that the back end, we created an editor so we could build the rules. And then one of the things we did is we started building operational systems for, for the government. And one of the things we did is we put a front end on it so you could do a, 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 G, a GIS, a Geographical Information System, a map. And you could say things like, is there any message traffic in the last 24 hours? And you could draw a polygon on a spot of the Pacific Ocean. Any message traffic that says there's um, a non-combatant oil crew, you know, vessel in this polygon and do that search. So the search is actually being done against text. But what the, the user is doing is inscribing a polygon and giving a couple of um, concepts that, that he wants, like uh, um, ships of a certain type. And then everything else is automated. So pretty cool. The other thing we did is a real-time scanner so that instead of just walking up to rubric and saying, I want all articles in the last 24 hours about um, Soviet cruisers, you could place a standing query. Actually, you and you know, 200 people at a, I don't know, an air base or an intelligence center or a company, which is what happened in later, 10 years later. We'll get to it. Everyone could establish their standing queries in the form of one or more of these little rule bases. And then every time a new document comes in, all of the rule bases would be fired against that one document. And if one of them matched above a certain threshold, which is on a zero to one scale, you would get an email, an alert, essentially, on your computer saying, this document just came in. So we did that by, I don't know, 85, roughly. So, so there was this real-time dynamic version. There was retrospective retrieval. There was a large document indexing. And then, of course, there was the knowledge creation and management of the rules themselves. So we built all that and started applying it in many uh, areas. Fabulously successful. I want to mention that a knowledge base, in this case, a set of rules about a single topic or concept that you're looking for in the text, isn't really, it's not really an expert system. Because I didn't go out and interview, let's say I'm looking for, um, I don't know, Soviet cruisers. I didn't go talk to five experts in Washington, D.C. on, you know, what do you look for when you're looking for Soviet cruisers? No. I, the user, input my own rules. So again, I'm sort of my own expert, essentially, even though maybe I'm not. So I came to call these systems preference systems instead of expert systems. The rules now are capturing my personal preferences for what documents I want to see. Maybe this is a little more obvious when you think about 
watching your sports teams. You know, you don't need an expert on baseball to know what words are going to show up in tomorrow's box score on the San Francisco Giants. You could create that yourself. Now, if enough people are interested in sports, maybe, in fact, we did this, uh, a guy named John Lehman started a company to create these concept structures and sell them to people so that, you know, everyone could get a high quality knowledge base and not have to do all the work. But the main, main thing I want to mention is, again, it's not, it's not a classic expert system. It's more like a personal preferential system. Um, let me, let me also compare this technology and, and the philosophy behind it to things like uh, the Google search engine. Because everyone's familiar with that, and it's like, ah, Google solved the problem, you know, go away. Although this, is, this predated Google by like 15 years, but yeah. other than that. Um, when the internet really took off in the 90s, so 10 years later, the problem was there's a lot of text out there and you want to make the search engine really, really simple to use. So today you have a very simple engine. You just type in a bunch of keywords and a bunch of documents immediately appear because they've indexed the world. That happens very fast. Thank you. But for every query you give it, basically you, you get back an infinite number of documents prioritized in some weird way. It's not actually that weird, but it's not very good necessarily. So you have to wade through. So they're counting on the fact that you're like everyone else. And when you put in these two words, you're going to want what everybody else wanted. But what if that's not true? If that's not true, you're, you're sunk. And you know, I use Google to do research on obscure topics. It doesn't work very well. So I was trying to do something different. My assumption was you have people one or a small group of people, they're the best in the world. And they don't want to just walk in and say, what's the score of the Giants yesterday? Every morning, they want to do what I used to do back at the AI lab. They want to see something about, did we find any more, I don't know, Soviet cruisers? Or what happened to the stock price of my company on NASDAQ yesterday? So these are knowledge workers. They have more or less the same queries every day. And multiple people have the same query. So that means you should spend more time building up the perfect query so that they get back one or two documents with the answer. They don't get back a list of, you know, 500 documents that they have to wade through. So that, so it's really sort of the other end of the spectrum from what the Google uh, search engine uh, was designed to do and does very, very well. So this really was designed for knowledge workers in corporations or large government labs or, or what have you, or maybe university departments that have the same damn query every day, but they want good answers. And wait, was this also, um, who was the, the client for this? The initial funding came from the intelligence community. Um, but it spread, it was like ASTA, I mean, it, better than ASTA. Uh, everybody, every three-letter agency you've ever heard of, and the Army and the Navy, everyone wanted it. And then, you know, the State Department, the FBI, and then, so basically, this thing really took off. So, in 1986, in parallel with this, we had other technologies that I was not involved in at ADS. So we had a list of like 20 technologies that we thought were ripe to productize in some way, either for the government or maybe with venture capital. Rubric was number two on the list. So we created a little group led by Cliff Reed, and uh, it consists of Cliff, Phil Nelson, Mike Cation, two guys from MIT, really crackerjack programmers, smart guys. And they tried to implement the first thing, and it failed. So then they said, OK. I can't remember. I'll, I'll have to look that up okay. <laughs> or ask Cliff. So then they went to, um, they, made, they made a mistake, obviously. It's like information retrieval. The first thing's not necessarily the right article. <laughs> so they went to Rubric, 
and, and, and built it, rebuilt it. it. Up to this point, 1986, it was in Lisp, very slow, but flexible. We could try out all sorts of things with it. They rebuilt it in C. It was lightning fast. So we took it venture capitalists, and we just hit the market just at the right time because the client server architectures were taking off. Every, every company in the world was adding, you know, Sun workstations with big database, corporate databases on some server. How do you get at the information? So uh, we spun off, we incorporated a company called Verity, spun it off. We essentially sold Verity all of the rubric technology as well as this topic uh, prototype that was done by Cliff and company. Oh, so the topic was the C version? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I don't think it was called topic then. I'm not sure. I'll call it topic, but I mean, it effectively became the topic product, oh, okay. even though it, it existed before the company existed. Okay. So what later was sold as topic by Verity. That's right. The That's technology right. that became yeah. that. What we did for a while there, and, and, and actually after Verity was started, is we would go to a new client and say, we're going to build you a customized engine. We'll build the back end to get the data in and index it. We'll build the knowledge bases and the graphical user interface. But the core engine, we're going to license. You're going to license from us. Eventually, you're going to license from Verity, uh, from Verity for a set fee. And that, that became the initial product. So we set that company up with um, the um, intellectual property of Rubrik and the, the topic prototype. We also gave Verity seven full-time employees, including Cliff and Phil and Mike Cation, uh, later Richard Tong. I did not go because, as I mentioned earlier, I like to, uh, I hate to call it dabble, but I don't like to work in one area for a long time. That's why I was doing both signals and text. I mean, nobody's crazy enough to do that, <laughs> but, uh, but I was. So we took seven of our best people and we raised venture capital. We brought in a guy who was on our board of directors, <clears throat> Mike Pliner, to be the CEO of Verity. And um, they took off. And um, after a few years, they were still using too much, something too close to the model I mentioned of having this engine and a lot of development and consulting services around it. Well, you couldn't go public with that, and people really wanted something more shrink wrapped. So they didn't get rid of that, but we brought in a new CEO, Philippe Courteau. He came out with a PC shrink wrapped version, sort of a low end version of Topic. I can't remember what year that was, I think it was 93 or 4. And at that time, the internet, of course, was taking off. So Verity went public in 1995. Uh, I think they sort of spun it as an internet company, even though it really wasn't. It was a search company, but at that time, there wasn't a Google, so nobody knew that that was a good thing, you know, or important. Um, it was the second largest Silicon Valley IPO of 1995. The first one was Netscape. Verity was number two. So it was really the development of the technology, the prototyping of the product, the creation of Verity, and the going public was just perfectly timed for uh, not only the technology, that is the client server, uh, more text was getting put in the databases by corporations, the internet was becoming available and so on. It was just perfect, you know, we just lucked out, what can I say? <laughs> really, a lot of this is about luck. Okay, within a year or two after going public in 95, Verity had a market cap of one and a half billion dollars. So it, it uh, did, did very, very well. And then it moved into knowledge management and eventually sold to another knowledge management company. And then that company eventually was sold to Hewlett Packard. So it's actually a product you can buy today from Hewlett Packard. And my friends at Hewlett Packard say it's still the largest search engine in the world when measured by number of seat licenses sold. Obviously, you don't buy a Google search license. What you get from them is advertising. It's a different, totally different business model. This is a classic buy license. 
by a site license, by a license for a thousand people in your company or whatever. Classic early software, uh, 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 enterprise software uh, sale. Um, let's see, yeah, that's, that's about it. I, I want to mention the people who made Rubrik happen besides me. Jeff Dean and I really uh, were the co-inventors or co-creators of the whole concept. And Jeff and Dan Shapiro and later Richard Tong and Vic Asplin, who I mentioned before, were the implementers of it. And we did a lot of research to figure out better ways of doing things. Um, and Jen, John Lehman built a lot of these applications and spun off this company to do the knowledge engineering of these concept bases. And then a little bit later, Joe Rockmore took over this whole area for me. Right. I sort of moved up a level. And he became the head of all the text work. And as I mentioned, I had been working with him since 1978, since I went to Systems Control Inc. And um, okay. There were, I think you mentioned yesterday that there were two other spin outs of ADS successful. Yes, ones. there was one in a, a biotechnology workstation that spun out, both of them spun out after, after 88. I think it spun out in 90 and um, eventually failed. And I don't know, because I'd moved on by then, so I don't know exactly why that was. Uh, in between, there was a company called Ariel, which I was involved with to some degree. Uh, it was wonderful technology. It was a, um, what's called a belief network, also known as a Bayesian network. And it was an editor that allowed you to create belief networks, compute them, and then vis most importantly, visualize them in different ways. So you could actually view a belief network and the data in the network as a spreadsheet or as a graph structure. And I think they had one other way you could view it. And that was wonderful technology. I think it would have succeeded, but the funder, it was not VC funded, it was funded by a company that was trying to pivot called Mad Computer Corporation. Now, Mad Computer Corporation, 1989, had the world's fastest but also most expensive PC. Turns out that's not what corporate America wanted. They wanted really cheap PCs where they could buy 10,000 at once. So Matt eventually went out of business, and along the way, they stopped funding Ariel. And Ariel, we couldn't pivot fast enough to get that level of funding, so it went under. So we did three spinoffs, one, one of which was wildly successful, and the other two failed, but not for good reasons, I think. <laughs> That's, as I said, a lot of this is just timing and luck. Um. So then ADS continues to chug along on its own um, until 1991? Yeah. So we spun out Verity in 88. Everyone said, oh, this is a really great idea. That's why we spun out two more companies. The problem was there were another six people, mid-level managers, that wanted to be queued up so we could spin out their company. And so the core R&D group lost cohesion. So basically it became a big management nightmare of how to keep the, the R&D group that we'd started in 79 going, generating ideas, but also bring in venture capital and spin people out. And I think it could have been a sustainable model, but in our particular instance, which is actually one of the few in the world, <laughs> it did not work. So we ended up, as we could see that the R&D company itself was not continuing to grow, we decided to sell the company. Um, we'd done three spin-offs, and they hadn't f succeeded or failed yet at that time. So we s sold the company to Booz Allen Hamilton and became a division of Booz Allen and Hamilton. And at that point, I got a promotion. I became the chief technologist, in essence, of Booz Allen Hamilton, which was a worldwide consulting company with, I think, uh, at those days, maybe 600 million of revenue, and now it's a multi-billion dollar revenue company. Why, so why them? What, uh, what? They wanted to, they did um, 
system engineering work, but they weren't really software developers. They could do simple integration of simple systems, mostly relational databases. So to me, it was pretty low-tech stuff, but also to some of their visionaries, it was low-tech stuff. So they wanted to get into system integration. They could see that companies like uh, Computer Sciences Corporation and um, SAIC and IBM, of course, and others were making more money on larger contracts. So instead of a $500,000 contract, they were looking to get a $5 million or a $50 million contract. So they bought us to get technology and to get some expertise in how to uh, build these systems and how to um, convince clients to hire us. And by then, I had, we had some expertise in this commercialization process, but we had also installed a number of these rubric topic systems as well as ASPIC and others. So we had, we had technology and some expertise at system building. So that's, that's why they uh, bought us. The experience didn't work out very well because we looked more like a SRI International, you know, highly paid think tank. Yeah. And they were a very buttoned down, let's go consult for IBM or the State Department. And uh, it was a massive cultural mismatch. Yeah. So most of the middle managers from ADS that moved over were gone within a year and a half. In fact, I was gone within just over a year. Right. I'd say within two years, there were only a dozen senior people, either senior technologists or, or managers left at Buzan. So your, your question is a very good one. We had a good story, but what we didn't understand was much more important than what do I bring to the table and what do they bring to the table? And did those things complement each other? Which was true. The cultures don't complement each other. Um, and business schools teach case studies. A typical merger and acquisition does not work. And it's not because not everybody doesn't want to make money or they all have the same vision. It's that the cultures don't match and the people that are the acquired company can't get along. They can't figure out how to fit into the new culture. I mean, it's simple things like at Booz Island, you had to have a uh, Mont Blanc pen that cost $100. For somebody coming out of Stanford University, Silicon Valley, the notion that that's important to you or your bosses or your employees or your clients is so foreign yeah has to be ludicrous. I mean, that's just one tiny example, but there, were, there are hundreds of things like that. So it really, it really didn't work. So within a year, I left. Yeah. What, what, what had you been doing? You, you said your role there was... Um... I was trying to help them. Uh, all the, there were like 50 practices. It was a very flat organization. Each practice was headed by a partner. They were scattered all around the world. And I was trying to help maybe half of them learn about how to do software development and integration and learn about a variety of technologies. Not, I mean, AI was really just one. So it was very basic stuff. The best relational databases, client server architectures, you name it. So we had lecture series and, uh, on the, all of these different topics. We had cross-fertilization where ADS or other practices would give talks about what they were doing so everybody else could see that. So it was a uh, coming up to speed exercise, which would have been fine except for the cultural issues. Right, okay. So then you leave and then you start up um, a new uh, Montgomery & Associates. That's so Montgomery & Associates was a little consulting company with maybe a dozen people headquartered in Santa Barbara, I'm sorry, Santa Monica, California. They had one guy, very senior guy, who eventually became the Assistant Secretary of the Air Force, Larry Delaney. He ran the office in uh, Washington, D.C. And so I started uh, them an office on Sand Hill Road. And we were doing more business consulting for technology industries, but it was mergers and acquisitions and uh, things like uh, 
tell me the size of this market in five years of market assessment, all sorts of stuff that use my mini MBA experience. I had spent a few weeks at the Stanford Business School in one of their short courses. And of course I had, by now I had more than a decade of uh, experience of my own in high tech. So we were basically going out and helping various companies do various things. So what, you had taken this short course while you were at ADS? Yes, that's okay. right. Yeah, they paid two or three of us. They paid for us to go back to become mini MBAs. As we got bigger, we realized we need more management expertise and we can bring it in, which we did, but we can also all become smarter. Really good idea. So then um, that lasted for two years? Uh, till 95? Right, that was uh, oh, just over two years. That's right. Okay, and it was part during this time that you did the, the work for the FAA? Yeah, so as I said, we did all sorts of different types of work for, for the government, aerospace companies. We did work for the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, uh, Livermore National Labs. Um, and I got a, a social, because, again, because of my background on advanced software, I got hooked up with a group at the Center for Naval Analyses, and they were asked by the FAA, the director of the FAA, to analyze this large system that IBM was building for them called the Advanced Automation System, AAS. It was going to be the next generation of air traffic control. We actually have it now. 25 years later. <laughs> uh, I'm not sure how much detail you want to go into that, but it was the largest software build in the history of the federal government, probably wow. still is. And the original budget for it was a billion and a half dollars. We came in and looked at it, had them recost it. This is hardware and software, so it's a lot of hardware scattered around all the airports in the country. And we figured it was going to be, end up being north of $5 billion. So we recommended, we meaning this large committee, I was just on the software subcommittee. We recommended that they essentially cancel the current contract and break it up into smaller groups, smaller pieces, recompete it. That's what they did. And then you also have um, this Peace Shield lawsuit. Yeah, so. Um, one of the things I did at Montgomery and then also later at Silatian is sort of um, expert uh, witness work. Um, and on much larger programs, there is no one expert. So, for example, in Peace Shield, Boeing had been fired, terminated for cause, terminated for default. That is, the Air Force said, you're building this big radar system for us, and you're not, you haven't met a milestone. We've decided to just cancel the contract. And under the terms of the contract, the half a billion dollars we owe you, we're not paying you. Boeing said, but your, your termination terms are incorrect. And so we went in and said, we'll play outside experts as if we were the government. We're going to look at all your hardware and software and where things stood as of the day of termination and prove to a court that there was no grounds for the termination. So even if the government doesn't want to start it back up, <clears throat> they owe you all the money you were owed on that day. And we did that. I have a couple other things I wanted to ask about. Um, so says on your resume you um you were a panelist on the 1993 technology summit along oh, yeah. with the secretary of defense william perry and under secretary of commerce mary good yeah right um well a little bit about that uh bill clinton got elected and came into office in i guess january of 93 and one of the first things he wanted to do was inject high technology as a way to grow the economy so he held this summit it was held near San Francisco International Airport. And uh, Al Gore shared the summit. And they had all sorts of 
undersecretaries and assistant secretaries and experts on this, that, and the other thing. And there was one panel. Now, by the way, 93 was after 1989. You'll recall that 1989, the Berlin Wall fell. And by 93, the Soviet Union had collapsed. So what was happening also was the federal government was drawing down the budgets of the defense, the national security complex. And the question was, you're going to have hundreds of thousands of people, some of whom have PhDs. What are you going to do with these people? So this panel had to do with reinvesting the seed corn that we got, we paid a lot of money for during the, the um, Cold War. And how do you get those people out into commercial industry? And that's what that panel was all about. So that's why you had an undersecretary of commerce as well as Bill Perry, who was, I think at the time, he was deputy secretary of defense. And then he moved up a little bit later. Why I was on there, actually, I don't know. <laughs> but, you know, I had done what we've talked about. Uh, ADS was primarily funded by the Defense Department, and we had spun out uh, a few companies, one of which was Verity, that became very successful. And so I had a little bit of history in high tech and also making defense-related technologies into commercial products. Um, I wanted to step back really quick to ask about um, two systems that were used in military op operations, one in the invasion of Panama and then, and then in <coughs> Operation Desert Storm. Were these related to the stuff at ADS that you had mentioned? Uh, the they were ADS systems um, and I developed them or my group developed them. Uh, but we haven't talked about them. Oh, I see. You, you want to hear about them? Uh, what, the one in Panama really ended up being a piece of hardware. Okay. So it's, it's sort of irrelevant. It was someone else's hardware. and okay. We reverse engineered it. And suddenly the Pentagon said, we're going to invade, uh, I guess it was Haiti? Or Dominican? It was Haiti. So it was what? George, first George Bush invaded Panama to remove Manuel Noriega in oh. Operation Just Cause. Oh, Panama. Okay. I don't know about that one. I think we were, I think we were involved in that too, but I can't remember how. There was, I guess Reagan had invaded Granada or something. Granada. Maybe that was it. That was an earlier one. But it was not AI. It was just some ancillary thing to a project we had been working on. But then the one in Desert Storm was an expert system. Yeah, that was a uh, Bayesian network for alerting on Scud missile launches. And it was developed to give us a warning if the Soviet Union started getting ready. As you may know, you can't just push a button and launch a missile. You have to fuel the missile, or in the case of these Scuds, they're launched off of trucks with a launcher on the back. And the trucks are parked, and they have to have gasoline, and the missiles have to have a warhead and especially if it's a nuclear warhead, that makes a big difference. So it's nice to know where the, war, where the warhead came from. So we had a system that would, if you had the right sensors, would figure all this out, what was going on on these bases throughout Eastern Europe. <clears throat> but the Cold War ended, but suddenly the Iraqis had scuds, and they were launching them at any place they could, you know, the Saudis, Kuwait, Israel, they were launching them all over the place. So we used this system to, to help alert when they were, although it didn't quite work right because it was knowledge-based, and they didn't do same. But the nice thing about the Soviet Union is they always did everything the same way. <clears throat> they had rigorous training, and they never deviated. So you, even though you give the same Scud missile to the, to the Iraqis, you have no idea how they're going to use it. They don't have the training, the money. They don't have the same, probably the same launchers. So this is a very good example of if you build an expert system and you make it work really, really well in this one problem, and then you say, oh, it's just a Scud missile launch. Bring it in here. You have one day to, to turn it on. It's not going to work because the knowledge base isn't right anymore. Sure. So it was used. It, it, it worked to some degree, but of course... 
it, it could have been better. So um, we have very few, very little time left. Um, maybe we could talk really quickly about your work at Saladian. Oh, yeah. So um, Montgomery Associates changed directions, strategic directions, and a lot of partners left. And by then, I had hired Joe Rockmore to Montgomery. So we both left and started at the same time, started Siladian. And Siladian existed for, uh, I guess, 18 years. And it was always just two of us. So we got rid of all the management pro problems. The only problem we had is market our consulting services and do the work and make clients happy. So that's what we did for 18 years. And it was work very much similar to what we've been talking about, except I now no longer had a development team. And sometimes people brought me in. Uh, I mean, DARPA brought me in. They had three or four contractors, and they put this software system together to be installed out at. The good news was it was installed at Pearl Harbor. But they couldn't get it to work, so they made me the um, manager for, the, uh, for a day, actually, for a year. And so I got that project back on track because it's something you know, I sort of knew how to do, right. having done it many, many times. So just sort of consulting on different projects. Yeah, coming in. Yeah. yeah. All sorts of different projects. We did more legal work. We got very good at breaking software patents. You can talk about that. My claim is that if you give me a software patent, I can break any software patent because there's always prior art right. and I can find it. Validate the patent, and we did it. We only did it maybe three times, but to me it seems pretty easy. <laughs> Basically, the patent system, as you probably know, in this country is broke, yeah. <laughs> and this is just an indication of it. If you can't establish a patent, the people up front will give you a patent for anything, and then you have to fight it in court to show that they should never have had that patent in the first place. Right. And that's really what was going on here. Some of these patents were worth a billion dollars. Wow. Uh, we did some work for uh, Nintendo. They had a new video game coming out, but they were infringing somebody's patent, so we had to show that the patent was invalidated so they could get their product out. <laughs> I mean, things like that. Uh, you created the st um, stock index? The yes, uh, you may remember prior to 2000, there was a bubble and a big crash, a tech crash in 2000. Prior to that time, the internet and Silicon Valley were going crazy and the stock market was going crazy. There were a lot of high-tech magazines started, Wired Magazine, Upside, and three or four others. Um, so Upside hired me as a consultant. Oh, they were opening an office in Times Square and they were going to have an internet radio station about high-tech companies. So they said, well, we want to track all of the companies as they go public. So we need a, our, we want our own stock index. We don't want the NASDAQ 100 or the S&P 500. So I created for them the Upside 150. Had 150 high-tech stocks, didn't matter which uh, main market um, they were on. And it was developed it was a matrix, and all 150 companies fit into one slot in this two-dimensional matrix. And the ma one dimension of the matrix was hardware, uh, computing-level hardware, software, and uh, componentry, uh, chips and boards and stuff. And I can't remember what the other matrix was. And then each country, a company was in one of these cells, and so we... Actually, let's say it was three by five, that's 15. So 15 different numbers and then a sort of a composite number for the whole 150. So that way you could see if software companies were going up while well, hardware companies were not. It was an interesting way to keep tabs on the public high-tech market. And so uh, USA Today said, this is the best technology um, index there is. Unfortunately, it was only operational for a couple of years because they, after 2000, most of these magazines 
one under. <laughs> but that was actually a lot of fun doing that. Yeah. And it was really easy to like get way, way beyond the S&P 500 because the index that are out there, or even the ones that are handmade where some magazine would say, well, I just pick 20 companies and that's my technology index. But why those 20 companies? Oh, well, I don't know. <laughs> so I had, you know, I had a knowledge-based organization of the technology space. That is the information technology space. Um, so sort of wrapping up, um, a lot, so you went, as a lady, and you, you, did, you went back to doing a lot of contracts for DARPA again. Oh, yeah. Um, was there any particular reason, just you knew the space, or you, you liked being in the defense yeah, space? Yeah, I think I, maybe I got a little bit bored with all these consulting gigs I've been talking about. And I had friends that were rotating in as program managers at DARPA, and Dick Wushner started a whole new office at DARPA, and he hired Joe and me to help him hire. I mean, we were hiring programming man program managers, starting new programs, helping them manage the programs. We were like program managers, except we didn't work for the government. Oh, okay. And we didn't have their authority either, but we could basically be jacks of all trade and do a little bit of everything. So I started around a dozen programs, some in AI, some in cybersecurity. We tried to automate the social sciences, um, wide, wide range of subjects. I think I mentioned a few of them in there. Um, uh, large knowledge bases, computer security. Learning by instruction was a neat one. We realized that these learning algorithms are never really going to work. What you want to do is create a knowledge base and a lear learning algorithm that interacts um, with an expert and is essentially taught by the expert. So the expert's now a teacher. And the teacher could say, we're going to learn algebra I'm going to teach you what the plus sign means and the equal sign, how to solve algebraic problems. And the teacher would actually talk to the computer that way. And the computer would build up a symbolic knowledge base, not a neural net, not a Bayesian net, but actual symbolic knowledge that can be used to explain and solve other problems, which I think in the long run is the right way to do learning, but of course, and that's what people are good at. That's why you go to school for K-12. That's the way you learn knowledge incrementally. So we tried to build a computer and had reasonable success um, doing that. But again, that's, it's really at the hard end of learning. So I guess um, finishing up, you um, I, did you, in 2013 is when you stopped um, working at Siladian? Yeah, basically my wife died in 2011. By the end of 2012, I said, I'm going to stop doing what I'm doing because I don't feel I'm giving enough attention, enough value added to my clients. So Joe went off and kept doing his thing with a, another company, and I retired at, in December of 12, and we actually shut the company down at the end of 13. And so I've been retired ever since and not thinking about any of these sorts of things <laughs> until this week when you know Ed Feigenbaum called me and said we're reviewing expert systems from the from 1955 to 1990 and I go oh my god <laughs> so I'm amazed I've remembered anything <laughs> from way back then but uh. so what um, what is th what's the thing what is the thing that you're most proud of in your career? Well, at one level, it's that I, I've been able multiple, multiple times to walk into a new situation with just my wealth of experience, but no knowledge of this new company or domain or problem, quickly get up to speed and help them solve a problem, a very valuable problem. So I have multiple... Uh, instances where I either made a company a billion dollars, saved them a billion dollars, avoided a lawsuit for a billion dollars, 
I mean, large amounts of money. I really wish I had been um, on a commission. You know, 1% commission over the years. I would be a very wealthy person now. <laughs> so I think my basic idea going back to um, high school that I'm a problem solver. I'm essentially a consulting engineer by mental predilection, interest, style, was correct. And I, um, I got to help a lot of people. Now, in the middle of that, I had my own company and actually got to develop my own software. So I think I probably had the most fun and the biggest impact doing that. That was ADS. Or, yeah. So that was that 12-year period. That was probably the most interesting part of my career. Where do you think um, how, where do you think the computer industry and maybe in particular AI is headed in the future? Um, I think we're going to see a lot more cars running over a lot more women. <laughs> I've been predicting this for years. It finally happened, and so this gets back to the tension between expert and knowledge-based systems, general-purpose systems, um, learning by neural nets versus learning by example or learning by explicit instruction. Everything that we're doing today in, in deep learning is neural net based. It's totally data driven. If the data uh, doesn't cover all the edge cases, the one, one in a million time cases, and that woman walks across the street, not in a crosswalk, you will run the woman over because that's the nature of that learning algorithm. Now they're starting to put expert systems on top to control the learning algorithms. That's a very good idea. So I think we're ending up back to this hearsay two model. We're going to have hybrid approaches with multiple learning algorithms, multiple expert systems, other algorithms that are not expert systems at all, uh, that do automated feature recognition out of images or whatever. And you bring all that expertise together. It's like bringing 10 experts on different topics in a room, handing them a problem. They're going to do better than any one expert. So that's where we're headed. And that's, I mean, in a way, it's, we're coming full circle back to uh, the hearsay two model of the 70s. Um, so, which is good. So there's hope. We're going to have problems before we have um, solutions, but we will have solutions. And lastly, what advice would you give to a young person starting out in their career today? In terms of what fields to go into, or well, I guess maybe somebody, the world. somebody in computer in the computer industry. Well, I think you need to do what I did fairly early on, although I didn't do explicitly. I didn't think about I want to be a consultant. I want to be a consultant, but I've always wanted to help other people. I'm, I, I like to do that more than say, I want to be the CEO and build an empire so everyone knows I'm in charge of a company with a thousand people. To me, that's like so much drudge work. So you need to know yourself. And the only way you can do that is by trying out different things, different areas of technology in college or high school, different programming assignments, different types of jobs, different types of bosses and learn what, don't get trapped too early because you can get trapped in being a programmer of this class of learning algorithm and you can do it for 40 years and you can make tons of money, especially if you're good at it and it's the right area of algorithm, but you may be bored out of your mind. Uh, you may not think that the problems you're solving or your company's solving are important problems any longer. So don't get trapped, you know, don't uh, keep an open mind. Thank you very much.